Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining uh, in part two of the Rhino 7 uh, tutorial. Uh, the, the IDSA Seattle is super excited to have you. Um, I want to first thank the board, uh, or if you guys want to wave, um, the board's all here. Um, also want to thank uh, IDSA Seattle, which was just Ginger, <laughs> who is uh, manning the behind the scenes uh, of this whole Zoom call. And um, uh, I'll, my name is Herman Chan. I'm the co-founder of Form Future uh, and a board member here at IDSA Seattle. Um, Rhino has a dear place to me because uh, like many students, <laughs> you start off learning the program. I didn't know that they were actually based out of Seattle until probably like eight years into my career when I was designing at Teague. And actually, uh, I think took some advanced surfacing lessons, probably with Kyle <laughs> or, or one of your staff. And uh, what I quickly learned is that they're just a, they're, it, it feels like a family. It's, it's just, a, it's a small company that is very passionate about providing I, I, top end, uh, like intuitive software, I think to, to the masses, because a lot of the designers I know tend to model in Rhino or SolidWorks. And um, um, so again, very grateful to have you guys here and um, to, to showcase what I found, I found out, I didn't know too much about Rhino 7 until the first part one, but that they really revamped the entire rendering engine from scratch, which uh, is the most significant update to Rhino since its creation. Um, what I'm incredibly interested to learn is, as well as everyone here is that it actually will render as you're modeling that completely changes the game in the design process. So um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you Scott Davidson and Cal Hutchins, uh, who will be presenting to us today. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna, we're gonna do, try to do similar, similar setup to last time. I'm gonna go through a very quick little slideshow here. And then Kyle's gonna get into the nitty gritty of using the tools and, and looking at some of the features. Um, I think that the point that, that we're trying to uh, kind of get here is that Rhino 7 has a completely new render engine in it. And um, it's based on the cycles engine. And uh, therefore, um, I guess if I had to say anything that, uh, you know, it might be time to, uh, to take a step back and take, and take another look at Rhino as, a, as, as part of a, one of your re many rendering tools that, that you might use uh, in your process. Um, I know that you've had a, a, a meeting uh, with Keyshot, and and um, we want to make sure to mention that you know Keyshot um, has worked very closely with us and continues to do an excellent product, and um, continues to work with Rhino Seven, um, and 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 that's a really important tool um, in this process or in the in the overall set of tools that you could use with with Rhino. Uh, V-Ray is another very popular render um, and, and for products. And, and so um, they also have done a lot of work with uh, Rhino uh, and also now have um, actually some Grasshopper components. So you can drive some of the, the materials and, and things through Grasshopper with v, into V-Ray. Um, and, and both of those products um, are really, really, really good products for doing final renderings um, very uh, nice effects and things like that. And, and really what, what we've done with Rhino 7 is really try to revamp rendering and display in order to accelerate your kind of your everyday, your in design process um, or, uh, renderings. And, and it's, it's quite interesting what you can do. Um, one of the things we have done is we've upgraded our, the ability to do the working modes um, you know, we have a more extensive uh, render mode and now what's called ray trace mode, which actually uses cycles in the viewport as a working mode. Um, and, and, you know, the, all the views, the, these view uh, types are also configurable. So you can configure your own style. Um, if you just Google Rhino advanced display, there'll, there'll be tutorials on how to update the displays, create your own display modes. Um, you know, for instance, the, the vehicle up to the left there. Well, all of these are working modes, actually. So you, you can actually model in these modes, but you can do screen captures of them. In Rhino 7, you can do screen captures of as high a resolution as you want. 
Um, and that's a great way to capture some of these if you want to present with these two. These are all, uh, these are all real time. Um, and so there's just no waiting at all. Um, and, and so, you know, you can see here, uh, another thing that we do in Rhino 7 is, is that now clipping planes is supported in the, in the, in the view modes and the rendering modes. Um, and, you know, so this is just a quick example of that. Um, hey, another, Scott, hey, Scott, yeah. Scott, yeah, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. You can't see this here. Try this. Uh, you know, it's really hard to show rendering without sharing the screen. That is, that <laughs> imagine, is just totally you, unusual. Though. All right. So display modes, you know, so, so you can see this now, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so you've got these different display modes. It's important to understand that these are working modes in, in uh, Rhino. And, and so you can set these up, you can create your own display modes um, and, and then, and actually edit these, but then you can also capture them real time. Um, you can do animations with them uh, and things like that. So that's a, that's a really good, uh, thing to know about. It was in Rhino 6. It's been extended in Rhino 7. Um, and uh, anyway, so we're talking here about uh, clipping planes are now supported in all the rendering modes. So you can do your own clipping planes and, and um, you know, it does the fills and different things like that for you. Um, another big feature that that's that's uh, seems subtle, but it's a really big deal is we have per face materials. And so now you can assign a material to a single face or multiple, you know, faces inside a poly surface. So you don't have to split them up anymore um, to assign materials and different texture mappings to different faces. So um, that's, that's a, another area that we've improved with Rhino 7. Um, the, the, like I said, the display modes, the render mode itself has changed quite a bit. So now you can do a lot more work in render viewport. And this is actually our ray trace view. If you were to use the ray trace view and the final ray tracing now both use cycles. So there's more of a linear flow between what you see in the viewport and what you get in the final rendering. And so that's an area that's important to understand, but now you can do, you'll see Kyle doing a lot of work in the viewport. Um, that previously you couldn't done. Another thing that that we've done, and this is this is, I guess, one of the probably the most one of the most critical things. One of the things is we have HDR lighting. Um, the lighting that you're seeing here in these renderings, you know, has fall off now, which you know other products have had forever. But Rhino, it's new to Rhino, so that you can get a lot more realistic uh, view in the viewport. And we've also worked on speed. And so for instance, this rendering took 15 seconds. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is that, you know, we can use GPU acceleration now. So you get the big NVIDIA cards or, or Intel or uh, AMD cards, um, and they can, they can start to apply all their GPUs to the rendering. Um, but um, the other thing that we've done, which is very important is, um, We've gone and we've applied, we can now apply, apply denoising filters to the rendering. So, so in the past, when you've rendered, um, you know, you see a, a lot of dot pattern, a lot of dots or a lot of noise in the image, and you have to wait a long time for let that noise go away. Um, you know, this is a, a interior with some indirect light and, and you know, a lot of uh, transparency and things like that. This took eight minutes and 40 seconds. And, and from a from a rendering point of view, it could have easily been four minutes or three minutes, and it's, it looks very, very similar. And and the reason is is because we're using some new denoising technology that we've we've applied, um, and and that's built into to Rhino now. And and Kyle will show that a little bit more. Now I'm just going to jump through a few images of of the kind of renderings that we're seeing. You know, you're seeing some depth of field things like that. These are just renderings in process in Rhino. I mean, they're they're done. Uh, you know. As you're modeling, you, you know, the materials are signed and, and, and off we go, we can make those renderings. Um, and so, you know, you can see now that just kind of the results, the overall results of what you can get in Rhino are quite a bit better. Um, and, and so it's, like I said, it's, it's probably time to take a look at Rhino 7 and, and, and then, you know, just kind of take maybe another look at it because um, if you've tried it in the past, it's quite a bit different. And um, so with this, I'm going to let uh, uh, Kyle take over and 
he can show you actually how to get some of this done and, and some of the different features of Rhino 7. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. Um, let's do share the screen. All righty. Everybody see that? Great. So the, the, the thing about Rhino is it's always had rendering, right? It's always been built in and it's, it's had ray tracing and it's had, you know, all this stuff for a long time. And with V6 um, was the beginning of the path to uh, incorporate the cycles engine into Rhino. And a lot of the groundwork was laid there, but in seven, it's really kind of come into its own and it's become you know, a first class citizen in the Rhino universe and, and is really getting a lot of attention and a lot of updates. And, you know, with, with that attention and those updates, we, we have ended up, you know, with a, with a really pretty fantastic product that you may not have had a chance to give, to give a, a look at yet. So I want to talk a little bit about what makes up a great image and, and just generally speaking, you need three key things. You need materials, you need lighting, and you need an environment. And I guess the, the asterisk would be the fourth one would be you need a little bit of talent and creativity, but I'm assuming that everybody here has got that covered. So these, these elements all work together. And, and V7 takes the work that, that started in V6 and continues it in a number of significant ways that we're gonna, we're gonna cover here in some detail. So the, the breakdown of how this works, right? You've got your model in the middle here, right? That would be this. You've got a ground plane. It's either there or it's not. You're either floating in space or you're grounded on something. You've got some lights in the scene. But one of the most common things that people don't understand is how the environment interacts with all of these things. And you, the way to think about the environment is, imagine that your model is inside a giant sphere, right? And it's, it's infinitely sized, it's around you, no matter which direction you go, you're not gonna run into it, but it's always there. And it's the environment in concert with the materials working together and the lighting that, that brings the image together and really brings it to life. If you just have model and lights, you get a certain effect, which may or may not be fully realistic because the, the materials will end up being a little bit dead um, I refer to that kind of as fisheye dead because it doesn't have any of the secondary reflections that you would see typically, um, even in a photo studio, things like, you know, the, the stuff outside of the seamless reflects down into the object. Um, Chrome, for instance, takes 100% of its colors and its, and its appearance from the environment. So when you're rendering things that are metallics, the, the only two things that you really want to focus on is what color of metallic it is. And, the, and the, the color can override and add to the environment, but when you take the environment away, it's no longer metallic, it's just paint. And so we're going to talk about how all this stuff kind of fits together, but I put together this little graphic so you could kind of see what's going on. So imagine that this, that this environment, you know, I, I have it scaled small, but imagine that it's just massive and it's surrounding you. And this is either going to be an image or it's going to be uh, a pattern or whatever it is, you're going to use this to force reflections and lighting onto your model um, from an environmental point. And it can either be the primary light source and the primary reflection, or it can be a secondary source and we can use lights to, to help kind of tune that. So <clears throat> with, with that kind of covered, I want to talk a little bit about the materials. And the materials are live over here in this materials tab. And we have, uh, with version six, we added physically based materials. And physically based materials are really interesting because the definition that I pulled from, um, from, from CGI Obsession, and I've got a link here that I can give you this article. Um, PBR is also known as physically based rendering. It's a texture workflow which aims to simulate how light reacts with a model and attempts to simulate real life materials. And the cool thing about this is if we pop into rendered mode here, you can see I've got some physically based materials added onto this. And you can see right off the bat, this is a huge leap over what you may have seen in version four or five or six even. 
um, because we've added not only PBR, but we've also added support for Adobe Substance. And so some of the materials you see here on the right actually are Substance materials. The, the, there's a couple of different ways to build PBRs. The first and simplest way is we just simply create a physically based material from texture files. This is a new pick in the, in the materials tab. And if I come over here to a file I have set up already, you'll see that PBRs are made up of a bunch of different image channels. And we can select all of those image channels in one shot, say open, and then it's gonna bring up this texture selection dialog box. And it's gonna assign this based on the name. So each one of these images is subnamed alpha base color displace, displacement, emissive, normal, and roughness. And it's gonna go ahead and automatically assign those into those slots. If it does it incorrectly, you can just drag down and reassign it here and, and override that or copy it and use it in a different channel or something like that. But, but generally speaking, we did a lot of work on making sure that this stuff kind of just does its thing correctly. So we're gonna say, okay, go ahead and load it up. And you can say that it builds this material for you and then it goes through a little ray trace and re-renders the shader ball. And if I drag this on here and throw it on, you can see that it actually creates a pretty realistic version of this blue bathroom rug. Now, the one thing that you'll notice is that the texture is really coarse. And with the PBRs, if you come down here under the detailed settings, you can see all of the channels for all of these slots and all of the settings and everything down here that you can adjust individually. But what if I wanna do a global adjustment? One thing I've learned <clears throat> after 20 years of, of working with Rhino is there's a thing called a texture tab. <laughs> I just figured this out recently. I was talking to Andy, our rendering dev, and I said, this is really a pain to adjust. And he said, why don't you use the texture tab? It's been there for like 20 years. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so if you shift click and pick all of these, what you can do is roll down here and do things like globally change the repeats from one to four. And if I just hit the tab key because they're linked, it'll update. And it updates all of the repeats on all the textures all at one time. So it, it takes all the tedium of having to go back to the original material and pick through each one of these settings and say, oh, well, I gotta pick the image and then change the repeats and go to the next one and pick the image and change the repeats. If you pick a material, Go to the textures tab. All of your textures that are loaded in that scene are gonna be loaded, including the environments, by the way. And it gives you the ability to be able to, to, to batch adjust these things, which is super, super efficient if you're trying to do things like this. All right. Um, so the other aspect of PBRs is, is substance. And the, and the substance universe is really, Pretty actually, let me let me back up for just a second. The 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 next thing I want to talk about is is PBRs are also they're cross platform, they're a cross render engine. So if you put a PBR in Maya versus a PBR in Cycles versus a PBR in in V-Ray or something like that, assuming that they have the support for it, the materials should render very close, if not identical, across these render engines. It's one of the things that's nice about this PBR workflow is because it is an open it is an open format that you can get to. And if we go to things like, let me grab a, a model bank here. Um, there's like websites like called free PBR. All of these materials, if you scroll through here and, and click on them, these materials, if you download one and bring it into Rhino, it's gonna look like you see it here. It's gone are the days of, of downloading a, a, you know, a material from someplace and then throwing it in Rhino and having it look nothing like you see it here. These things look pretty much exactly like they do here. And if you were to drop it in, in Rhino cycles versus Blender cycles, or if you were to bring it into Maya or something like that, the, the look is gonna be very, very similar. And that's one of the benefits of PBR. So there's tons of model banks out there. They're, they're platform agnostic. They're, you know, in this case, I've actually had contact with the, with the guy who runs this website and he's a super cool person. And so there's tons of materials here that are available for your use that you can grab and, uh, and enjoy from there. So, <clears throat> so that's free, the, the PBR kind of universe is, is open to you to be able to just kind of explore on the internet. The other thing that we've added in seven, and this is new from six, is substance support. And if you haven't messed with 
the Adobe Substance universe yet. Um, Adobe bought this this company what a year, a couple years ago, and they have just taken this and gone crazy with it. There's a bunch of different type of programs in here. There's Substance Painter, there's Substance Designer. Um, Painter is for actually 3D painting on models, which we support. There's a video on our YouTube on how to use that. Substance Designer is a really, really deep dive. If you want to go super deep into, into material creation, you can do it here. Alchemist is kind of a, a substance designer for dummies, or shall we say substance designer for Kyle, because this is what I use, because I'm every time I look at designer, it makes my forehead hurt. Um, but Source is this really, really big model bank that has pre-built materials. And if you grab one of these things and download it, not only are the materials built but there's presets built in you can see it scroll through there's half a there's you know three or four different variations of this particular material so if i download this thing from substance source i come over here to my materials tab and i hit the plus key there's actually a substance pick here and if i go to substance i go to the downloads folder where i pulled this and i've got the sbsar file which is substance format and i just go ahead and bring it into rhino and in that case i grabbed this this patinaed plank here and the cool thing about this if you zoom in in, in on these the quality on these is really really incredible um, they they look gorgeous they render gorgeous and the the other thing that i wanted to point out is this is rendered mode this is a working this is a working mode you can move this stuff around in real time. This is, you could model in this mode if you wanted to and enjoy all the benefits of the way that this looks. If I take this thing and I throw it into ray trace mode, which is actually now using the cycles render engine, you'll see that the, let me throw this to a smaller, I'll show rendered mode and ray trace mode side by side. You can see that with the exception of little bit cleaner shadows and a little bit sharper detail, you're seeing a really, really close representation between the two versus a full-blown ray trace rendering and rendered mode over here. So the linear pipeline and the way to use this stuff side by side starts to become really fluid. And, and it's very much kind of what you see is what you get. Now, does this ball have a little bit better reflection? Yeah, it does, you know, but for the most part in the past when you were doing concept work and you had to spend all of this downtime where you would tweak and render tweak and render tweak and render tweak and render to try and get something that would look good you know you've got a couple of hours of cycle time built in there to try and get a decent rendering out where now what we're finding is people are actually not using ray trace mode for concept renders to start with they're just using rendered mode and they're just sending stuff like this to the clients for the early looks. And it works fantastic, especially when you use the PBRs, when you use the substance materials and stuff like that. You can get really, really effective visuals from stuff without having to go into a full-blown render and, and you know make that amount of time. So it used to be, you know, back in the in the early days of this, you would make a render and you'd have to wait 15 or 20 minutes for it to develop. And maybe it was right, maybe it wasn't. You had to then modify it and then run it again. Now you can say, this is what it looks like. There's the first shot. There's the second shot. There's the third shot. There's the fourth. Here's the top. Here's the right. Here's the side. Here's the left. And you just simply send this out with screen captures. And you've got really effective visuals that you can use early in the concept process that are completely disposable, right? It didn't cost you anything to make these although you can charge for them because I do. Um, and and there, if the client wants to mark them up or do whatever to them, it's, it's fine. It's just like, it's just, you know, it's like sketches. You can just crumple them up and throw them away, but they're really, really awesome looking sketches now. <laughs> now, the only thing that I want to talk about with Substance is there is in the bottom of Substance Material, so if we click there, there is a box down here that says Embed SBSAR File. And in this case, this is not a big, a big deal because this one is only 23 KB. This one, on the other hand, is 279 megs. So you need to be cognizant when you're using substance materials, you need to check and see how big this thing is. Because if I turn on this one and I turn on this one, 
you'll see that my file size is going to jump over to 500 megs just by having these two materials in the file. Okay, so right now um, I've got, I think I've got a, I've got a bunch of stuff in this file, so it's big. But if I were to, if I were to just embed these two files, it would, this file size could pop up to almost 750 megs, which starts to become challenging for some lower, lower, you know, powered computers. So keep an eye on that. Um, it seems like Adobe is trying to bring the file size on these things down. I've had these materials for a very long time. And so um, they may be, uh, they may be trying to, to focus on that problem, but just be aware of that and make sure that if you do embed, you're gonna have some file size to deal with. Now, the cool thing about embedding them is you can just hand them to somebody and they'll render. You don't have to give them the materials as well, but, um, but just be cognizant of that from there. So, all right. So the next thing that we wanna talk about is lighting. And, and the cool thing about lighting in seven that we didn't have in six is light fall offs. And if I, turn on my panel light and let's back out a little bit. I've just got a panel light stuck up here and let's go to rendered mode and let's turn on so I can see the light. I'm just going to turn on the display so I can see where that light is. And I'm going to change the lighting on this from white to black because it's a little bit more effective. You can see a little bit more clearly what's going on. So I'm just going to change that to black. And you can see that if I turn this light on, you can see the, the effect of the light on the object. And if I set this to the original, the original um, light fall off was constant. So essentially there was no light fall off. So if I move this close, you can see, see how the intensity of the light doesn't change the farther away I get. It spreads a little bit and it moves a little bit, but the brightness stays the same and it doesn't it doesn't change because the fall off is constant. So that makes sense, right? If I change this to a linear fall off, you can see that as I get farther away, see how it starts to fade? And if it, as I get closer, it gets brighter. So this is basically, it's just, it's the most bright here and it's the least bright there. And the farther away you get, the intensity comes down. I've got this cranked up pretty high. So let's just, let's do it at 10. So it's a little bit easier to see. And if I, Pull this forward, you see how it brightens up and goes away. All right, so that's linear. And so you can tune this, which is really cool, in real time by saying, well, I can either adjust my intensity up here, you know, and drop the intensity of it, or I can just pull the light away farther. And so you get this really delicate, really lovely feel where you can in real time just see what's happening to the light and say, oh, that's kind of the sweet spot, maybe right there. That's just gives me the subtleness that I am looking for. Now, if I do inverse squared, which is the way light really works, then I have to, I have to play with my light intensities a little bit, crank them up, maybe even really high, but you can see that the effect is even more subtle and even more um, finessable than, than linear is. And so I find that, that inverse squared is really nice for being able to tune stuff just a little bit because you can just grab this panel light and just say, okay, I like everything about where this is going. I like where the shadows are falling. I like all that kind of stuff, but it's just too bright. And so instead of trying to mess with the intensity, which might screw up the light balance of the whole rest of the scene, just move it back a little bit and it just you just get this little like ee, you know <laughs> this really sweetness in there so <clears throat> so that's that's light fall offs and that's what that's one thing that's really cool for for version seven uh which has added a, a really nice level of control that we didn't have before so let me switch back to a white background so that we can see the next part that i want to talk about which is environment and skylight and skylight and environment are kind of linked together. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna push the skylight uh, down into the environment section. So let's talk a little bit about emissives. And actually for that, I'm gonna go back to black because no, actually no, I'm gonna leave it white. And um, I'm gonna shut this light off. And I'm just gonna hide that and let's, talk about emissives, which is a new material. And by the way, there's, there's a couple of new materials in seven. If we come down here 
and click on this, we have not only double sided, which is cool, because like, let's say you are rendering pages of a book, you could actually texture map one page on one side of a surface and the other page on the other side of the surface. So you wouldn't actually have to have two surfaces like you used to in the past in order to be able to do that. Um, you could just map it on one side or you could have one side red, one side blue, whatever. You can just pick the two sides of the surface and it's normal based. So if it's wrong, you just reverse the normals and it switches to the other side. The next one is a mission, which is really cool because it is actually a legit light source. And so I can take and add an emissive material to this and you'll see it's black because my intensity is at zero. This is a very simple material to control because you just pick the color and turn up the intensity. And you can see in rendered view, the effect that really isn't all that impressive. It's just kind of blasting out yellow everywhere. But when we throw this in ray trace mode, it actually does throw light and cast shadows, which is really, really cool. Think about LEDs, think about um, headlights on cars aren't quite as effective because we don't have atmospherics. So you can't get that cool like beam effect, you know? So um, you can't do that, but, um, but I've got my denoiser turned on. I'm gonna shut that off because it's a little aggressive right now. But you can see that as I take this thing and I move it around in space, it, it actually does throw shadows. And so there's a lot of things that you can do with this that are really, really cool. Now, the next step of the emissives is you can actually take the emissive and you can throw an image onto the emissive. If we create a physically based material, right? Let's do a new one real quick. And then down here, it says detailed settings. Well, the detailed settings give you all of the different choices that you can add, all of the different channels that you can add to this material. And in this case, we're just gonna add an emission material. And then over here, there's a button to click to assign where you get brings up an image browser where you can throw an image onto that. So I made one already and I just put two channels on it. I put a, I put a, base, a base color on which I mapped an image to, and then I made another one that's an emission that's got the, the same image map to it. So I'm basically doubling up on the, the image and the emissive. And if I take that and drag it onto there, you can see that it creates this cool kind of stained glass effect. And again, you don't really see the effect of it so much in, um, in the rendered mode. Let me turn it all the way up here and you can see that it starts to light up so you can get the feel that it's emissive. But if we go to ray trace mode, the cool thing about adding images onto things <clears throat> is that it actually will tint the color. And so if I turn this emissive up to like four, you can start to see, if we zoom in here, see how this has got a pink cast and then it's got a yellow cast over here. And if I grab this guy and, and turn it a little bit, you can actually see the colors of the projected light changing depending on what's facing it. See how we've got some purple cast on it in here. So now if you wanted to do a television, if you wanted to do an iPhone that had an image that was lighting up a character's face, if you wanted to do neon, if you wanted to do, um, if you wanted to do object-based lighting, and I'll show that later, where you actually create an object or a surface, like imagine, uh, imagine you were rendering a Wonder Woman toy and you wanted to do the, the lasso around and you wanted the lasso to cast light, you could actually turn the lasso into an emissive object and that lasso would actually cast light onto the character and give you this ability to be able to create these really, really cool light sources that you haven't been able to do in the past. So that's emissive, that's, that's, a, that's a, new, a new tool that we have in our, in our uh, bag of tricks here. So <clears throat> the next thing I wanna talk about is, um, is the environment. And, and the environment, the easiest way to understand environment is if I just throw a metal material on here, and let me hide these guys for the time being. And if I go to the render properties here, there is, controls for the environment within the render property context, but there's also an environment tab in here, which controls what environment we have loaded and some, some more basic controls in that. And so to be able to visualize this, remember that first graphic I showed where we had a, a sphere surrounding our, our model, um, we can actually visualize that by clicking this 360 degree environment and you can actually see the environment surrounding 
the object. And this is cool if you use ground plane, you know, you can keep it grounded. If I shut it off, it looks like it's just kind of floating in the middle of this giant sphere. So we'll put ground plane on that throws a shadow, use shadow only or a material. So it's just gonna catch a shadow down here. But if we go to the environment tab and I start rotating this, you can see that as I rotate the material or as I rotate the environment, the lighting and stuff changes on the object. And this is a really important tool to have in your toolbox because the environment works in concert with the material. So the reflection and the roughness of the material um, has a relationship with the environment as far as the lighting. And so those little secondary subtleties that you get because of the reflective property of the environment on the object is what makes these materials come to life instead of just looking like old, you know, fong shaders with a white dot, you know, boop. So my head is shaped a lot like a shader ball. So I use it a lot for examples when I teach classes. But um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's an important thing to understand there. And, and if we switch to a new environment, so say I've, I, I set one that's image-based, you can see this effect a little bit, you know, even more dramatically. So the, the white spot or where the sun is, is where the main focal point of the lighting is going to come from. And that's where the primary source, light source from the environment is going to come, which is going to cast shadows and things like that. So this position, this rotation is important to be able to understand. The, the other thing that we want to keep an eye on is do we want this, do we want to see the environment? If we don't want to see the environment, most of the stuff that that you know we do as product designers is studio shots, right? We want it to be in a scene and stuff like that. So we just click the solid color button and you can see that my reflections went away. And that's kind of a bummer. The reason it went away is because this is a metallic material that's reflecting a solid white environment. Well, how do we override that and keep it so that I can keep those cool reflections, but keep it in a studio setting? We're just gonna roll down here and say, use custom environment for reflection. So I'm gonna turn that on. I'm gonna pick my environment. And now all of a sudden I've got Chrome in a white, in a white, uh, in a white background, a white studio setting. Now there's a secondary thing in here where we can actually use the, uh, a custom environment for skylighting. Right now, the skylight is actually being generated from the global environment. So this environment right here is not only controlling the reflections, but it's also controlling the skylight lighting. And if I turn that on or off, you can see how it goes from sharp default lighting, right? Because this is a very harsh scene. So it's basically like a sunlit scene. Whereas if I turn the skylight on, it's actually softening that and creating a more global illumination, which tends to be a little bit more realistic. And we can talk a little bit about how we can cheat back and forth between there. Think of skylight as, as ambient occlusion as well, so that it gets your little subtle, your, your crease shadows and your cut line shadows and things like that. Skylight is going to give you that stuff where sometimes the harsher lighting makes it look a little bit like, you know, deer in a headlight CGI, very like, Eh, and you kind of lose a little bit of that subtleness. So skylight is, a, is an important kind of, you know, another element of this when you're thinking about your, your lighting scheme from a global point of view. The thing about skylight is it is 100% linked to the intensity of the environment. So we've got skylight here, right? There's an intensity setting. And if I change to a custom light, say I go to my studio and I'm taking my my lighting from my studio, now I have an override. So I can take this override and I can either set this to 0.25, which darkens the amount of lighting that's coming out of this, or I can bump it up and it raises the amount of lighting coming this. Now this particular scene has so much light coming out of it, you're not seeing much of an effect on that. But there is a, the, the, the fact is you can have a background, you can have a reflection map, and you can have a lighting map, and they can all be different depending on how you override this. Now, for the renderings that I like to do, I typically don't override the, the skylighting environment. I typically use the same lighting that I'm, I'm using on a background unless I want a specific type of chrome, for instance, but then the chrome is casting the model a, or the wrong color, I'll use a complementary color or, a, or, a, or an opposite color in order to balance it out sometimes. So there's some tricks that you can play with stuff like that. But, but these three settings all kind of work together. And if you wanna make it super simple, what I usually do is I just let the skylight come off of the same environment that I use for the reflections.
And so this allows you to be able to like render a car with Chrome bumpers and, and leave it in a white background. Now you can also map an image onto the material at the material layer. Um, you can put a reflection map on a, on a material and, and force it that way, but then you have to adjust it for each different material for th throughout the scene. All right, so let's, let's talk about how do we get environments. Um, and we do it the same way we do in materials. We're gonna click the plus. There's an environment library that comes with in Rhino, which has all of this different stuff loaded. You can just drag or drop any of these things or click and, and open any of these things to get a, new, uh, get a new environment. You can also go to the internet. We do use HDRI materials uh, for the internet. So you can go to things like HDRI Haven and you can go to like outdoor and these are all light probe HDRI photographs that you can download and throw in there. In fact, this is where I got uh, I think it was this one, this Kloppenheim 5. I just thought the name was funny, so I used it. Um, but you pick these down, and then when you make a new material, or when you make a new environment, if we want to start and build our own, we start with a basic environment, and then we go to assign the texture, and then we simply just grab the image that we downloaded, throw it into that channel, and then right-click on it and say set as global environment, and then it drops it into that scene. And then you can decide how you want to position it. And then you can go back here to the render tab and decide whether you want to actually see it or not. And if you do want to see it, uh, if you want to reflect it but not see it, then we just use this custom environment for reflections. And we come down here and assign it. And then the reflections show up. <clears throat> the other way to make environments is, for, is through um, HDRI photography. And Brian James actually is a really good um, resource on how to do that. He's done a bunch of it uh, already. Um, I keep trying to get him to teach me how to do it, but I think he likes having that knowledge to himself. So he hasn't taught me how to do it yet. So you got to talk to him to learn how to do that. But there's tons of uh, tutorials on the internet if you want to get into to, to doing your own environments. All right, so let's let's put this all together a little bit and take a look at an actual object. Sounds like my wife just came home, so my dog may wake up and bark like crazy. I apologize in advance. So we've got this model, and in ray trace mode, you can see that we already have a very good kind of representation of what this thing is going to look like. And right now, the environment on this thing is is a little is a little heavy. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to the studio, and I'm going to set this in white. And then I'm going to reflect the studio from there. And what I can do is find my spot, right? Where I want my shot to be. And then I can go to my environment tab and I can start rotating around to position my lights. If I'm shooting on a white background, I don't want white tracking all around the outside of the object, right? So I'm going to roll around a little bit until those top barrels kind of come into focus. And something like that is probably, probably close to what I'm looking for, right? And in this case, I'm not even gonna throw, I'm gonna hit ray trace and let this thing roll. And in this case, you can see, I've got a couple of emissives assigned here. So they actually look like they're lighting up. And I can adjust the intensity of those simply by just coming over here and I can drop them or I can raise them up, make them really crazy. So you can adjust that to get real LEDs for once instead of having to fake them through Photoshop. And you can see that it, uh, it's actually picking up some light off of this from there. Now, the other cool thing that we can throw in this that's, that's really fun to play with is real-time DOF. And if I go to my properties while a rendering is running. Now this is important because if I don't, if I'm just in rendered mode, a couple of my a couple of my settings disappear. So I actually have to be in ray trace mode to run this. And what I can do is I can start playing with things like the NVIDIA denoiser and you can get this from package manager. So I don't know how clear it's coming across in the meeting, but you can see that this is, has a lot of, let's start it over. 
you can see how much noise is in this to start with. See how speckly that is? Now I have a RTX 5000 Quadro card in this machine. So it's cranking right along pretty well. But if I go over here and I turn the denoiser on, that noise is disappears essentially instantly. And the cool thing about this, let's go back and do it one more time. Watch the clock in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And I have to point it out before I start because it happens so fast, you almost miss it. So it's gonna start the rendering with the denoisers on. We're at three, four, five, gone. Noise is done. At seven seconds, this is a rendering that we could show and charge for, <laughs> which is the most important part of all of this, right? So let's let it continue to run for a little bit. You can see the denoiser kicks in. Now, one thing you'll notice is the texture on this looks a little a little janky. As the, de as the rendering progresses, the denoiser revises itself and starts to get more and more accurate as far as what's starting to happen. And you can see if I shut the denoiser off, the texture is, is there, but as we progress down deeper into the rendering, the texture starts to come together. So if you've got things like concrete that's got texture in the concrete, the denoiser and the earliest levels of the render will wipe that out and it'll look kind of fuzzy. And so all you have to do is, is just shut the denoiser off to see what it's gonna look like. And then you can turn it back on later or just let it run and it'll resolve itself as it goes. And you can see that the texture on this is starting to get better and better as we go. One of the other fun things to play with is, is depth of field. And this is, this is one of my favorite tricks for making uh, mildly shoddy renderings look really awesome. <laughs> so we're gonna set this to manual focus. I'm gonna use the focal blur. I'm gonna use an O snap to snap to the front of this. And then you can see in real time that the, the depth of field starts to kick in. And I'm going to shut this. I'm going to go way down on this so you can see the effect more clearly. But it happens right there. And you can play with this and get really cool effects out of this. I like to add just a tiny, tiny, almost imperceptible amount of it. And it really tends to bring some life into the rendering that, that may look a little bit too CG if you don't if you don't add that in there but we're at 16 whole seconds right now i could hit the pause button on this this is something that i would be completely happy sending a client and charging them for and <laughs> and uh and move on with my life and go from there all right so let's look at another scenario here and i'm gonna bring this to rendered mode again. And the other cool thing that I like about rendered mode is there is the ability to be able to turn on the turn on and off the surface edges. And the surface edges is on gives it this really kind of cool almost like SketchUp feel where it's presentable, but it also has this feel of of sketchiness to it so that the client doesn't feel like they're too invested in this. They, they still feel comfortable making, you know, because how much time do we spend as designers trying to manipulate the emotions of our clients? Um, you kind of want to give them permission that they can make comments on this because sometimes if you send them something that's too finished too early, they're like, ooh, I don't know if I want to make changes on that. And maybe they won't say something. Maybe they're upset about something that they saw that they didn't feel like they because it's too late in the game or whatever. There's all sorts of emotions that get wrapped up in it when you're dealing with an emotional uh, uh, sport-like design. Um, so I found that sometimes when I send images like this, it almost gives them permission to be involved in the process, which sometimes can make it easier down the line because now they feel like they put their thumb on it, right? And so early on, I'll do a finished rendering like this. I'll put the lines on it. I'll give it to them and then get their input. And then you can say, hey, that was great input. Here we go. And then you shut the lines off. <laughs> Literally just shut the lines off. And all of a sudden, now it's a more finished product that they feel like, oh, look at that. It's beautiful. And look at what I did. And, and now, now I'm a designer, right? That's, that's <laughs> so anyway, there, stuff like that that you can do as far as using these tools to make your life easier and extract the information out of your client, which is one of the biggest challenges that we have when we're trying to do this stuff. All right. 
So let's look at the next example, which is one of my favorites, this, this Chaparral. And by the way, this was the other car that I was going to use for the Sub-D demo, but um, this was a little bit more involved than the, than the Formula One car. So if we go to rendered mode on this and take a look at what we've got, this is actually let's do let's do wireframe and take a look at, at how this is set up right now so i have this set up as a basic photo studio this is just a piece of seamless right this is just a spotlight that's a kicker for behind the behind the car and this is just a simple panel light so when i'm lighting stuff i try to go for the simplest possible solution and and the simplest one is just let the environment light it the the next simplest is one panel light period 90% of the renderings that you see me do have a single panel light and a single panel light only. That's the only thing in the scene. Maybe a little bit of skylighting or a little bit of environment, but not much else. And this one is kind of fun because I have the, the environment is set to black. So there's no real environmental reflections in it, but I do have an environment set for reflections. I just have it set really, really low. So there is a tiny bit of secondary reflection in the reflective surfaces of the object that keep them from those, you know, dead shark eyes. They have the little bit of sparkle, you know, in, in characters, they always have the white dot, ding, to make them look alive. That's what that environment, that, that little bit of environment gives you. So let's go back and take a look at what this thing looks like. And I have a named view set up for getting back to my renderings. So what I'll do is I'll pick all my poses set up name views for each one of those and then go through each one and set it up the way that I want. So if you look at rendered view with no lights on whatsoever, we can see the effects of each one of these lights as we turn them on. So I've just got a single panel light. I've got a single spotlight. The skylight's on, which is why you can see anything at all. And if I turn the spotlight on, you can see even in rendered mode, this thing will start to light up a little bit. And if we turn on the rectangular light, it should start to show a little bit. And if we go to ray trace mode, this thing starts to come together pretty quickly. In this model, actually, I get a lot of mileage out of a simple white paint material and a bunch of labels stuck on it. And I'll show you how decals work um, as we go down here, because decals have been rewritten in six as, as well. <clears throat> so you can see the, the effect of that spotlight in the background. If I shut that off, see how it just dies into the background. So what I did is I actually put a spotlight behind the object that doesn't shine any light on the object but shines a little bit of light on the object itself and that should pick the darker areas of it out of the background now the cool thing about ray trace mode is this is actually a working mode i can pick something and i can move it so if something's in the scene that i don't like i can move it and mess with it and actually adjust this in real time while the rendering is going which is really kind of cool <clears throat> and then it just recalculates and does its thing. And then if we turn the denoisers on, you can see, again, actually it's on. So we're at seven seconds and this is a fairly finished rendering. All right, so really simple setup. There's really nothing to this. And the, the subtlety of this, I don't know if it's coming across in Zoom or not, but the environment is throwing just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of additional light into this. And if I were to crank this up a little bit, let's crank it all the way up. You can see that where the, where the reflections of that start to happen, but it also lightens up the seamless too much, which is what I didn't want. So that's why I cranked it down a little bit. So you can play with all of these different things and get really cool kind of effects out of this depend once you understand how they all work together. All right. So let's look at you spent 10 whole seconds on that rendering and it's pretty much ready to roll which is you know fantastic um let's look at another version of this and if i go again to the rear three quarter on this i have another scene set up i punch the camera on this a little bit if i change the camera length lens length from 50 to 35 i get a little bit more force perspective which is kind of fun and then that, in effect, with the DOF, tends to get a really interesting effect. So if I run this, you can do things like add emissives back into the mix. 
Yeah, I'm just gonna just jump in here just really quickly because um, I think uh, we I want you to definitely continue. But for those that uh, need to drop off because it's one o'clock, um, this uh, this will be recorded on YouTube and posted uh, for your reference. Also, if you have any questions, you can directly reach out to Kyle via LinkedIn. Um, just uh, link, just look for him. And uh, Rhino is a super small company, so they're always looking for feedback and 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 all that. So dialogue is is very much encouraged. Um, so just want to bring that out there. And uh, again, thank everyone uh, who has joined so far. Great. Um, please please keep on going. Tom. Yeah, I'm I'm about I'm about four minutes from being done, so ah, you've okay. got a little extra time. Stick with us. Um, and so in this case, I'll probably throw a little bit of depth of field on. I'll snap it to the, the focal point to the tail light. And you can see just having that little bit fades out these decals in the front, which really gives this shot, you know, a lot of drama and a lot of feel. Throwing the emissives on, we get actually the tail lights lighting up and stuff like that, which this effect used to be very difficult to try to fake in Rhino um, in the past. So the last thing I want to talk about, actually the second to last thing I want to talk about is decals. And so if I go back to my original side view, uh, let's go back to rendered mode. <clears throat> and the way that this thing is set up, it has decals on it and the decal engine has been completely rewritten as of six. And all of the decals are gumball controlled now as opposed to how they used to be. They used to have their own individual widgets. But if I go to my decals tab here, if I pick an object that has decals on it, you'll see the decal icon shows up. If I go to decals, it lists all the decals that are involved in that particular object. And then if I pick one, say for instance, this Holly logo here or the Hearst logo, um, I'm gonna turn the widget on for it. And you can see in the top view, this widget shows up. Now, if I pick the widget, the cool thing about this is it's just gumball controlled. I can drag this around on the surface and put it where I want. I can rotate, scale, do things like that. I can even drop it on top of another label. And you can see right now that I would really like this label to be on top of this. So what I'm gonna do is go back and click on my surface that has everything listed. I'm just gonna grab the Holly logo. I'm gonna drag it underneath the Hearst and it's gonna reorder. And the, the Hearst logo now is back on top of this, which is something that, that was uh, difficult, if not impossible to do in seven. So adding a logo is really super easy. We come back here and pick an area that we wanna throw uh, a, a logo on. I just am gonna go ahead and add a decal and I had this loaded up and it moved on me, sorry. Oh, where'd you go? All right, let's just throw, even though it's not a Porsche, we'll throw a Porsche logo on there. <clears throat> Forgive me, Stuttgart. And uh, we'll just go ahead and drag this in space. I'm gonna do this in front view. So we're dead flat. Just drag it on. You can see it preview as you go. You let it go. And there it is. If you wanna mess with it, you turn the widget on for that particular thing find it, and then you can simply drag it around and place it the way you want. You can scale it, rotate it, do all sorts of things like that. So decals have become super easy to use now. There's an image I did of a race car um, years ago. I actually had my business logos and stuff on it. What I actually did was I cut the car into five different pieces. I cut the two sides off of it. I cut the front and the back off of it, and I left the center. And I actually textured the entire thing with decals. I put one decal over the entire side of the car. I put one decal over the entire top. I put one on the front, one on the back, and one on the other side. And then I just used the widget to move them around until they lined up. And it completely, I was able to texture the thing with logos and graphics and everything without having to do any texture mapping whatsoever. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice cheat. And um, 
And so decals are something that that has become super useful. And then the last thing I want to talk about is standalone versus ray traced. And you've seen me do all of the renderings in the ray trace window. If we come back here and pick a view. Oop, did I get muted? Can you say only, only for a second. You're good. Oh, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I must have hit the space bar. So we've got we've got our scene set up, and then the only difference between ray traced and standalone is if I launch the standalone window, the standalone render tends to go just a little bit faster than the ray trace window does, which is you know at 16 seconds we're splitting hairs, but um, it also does have a little bit more effect that you can throw in here. So we've got post effects, um, we can show curves, we can show surfaces and ISO curves. There's bloom, glow, fog, depth of, depth of field, and multipliers. And these are all based on the depth of the image. And you can see that the denoiser has already kicked in at, at 10 seconds and given us an image that we can kind of evaluate and see what's going on with. But if we wanted to add additional things to it, we could do that here. The other thing that's been added is there's a new filmic tone mapping. So if we wanted to come here and use a little bit more dramatic uh, tone mapping, we have some defaults set up to be able to do that. Um, I tend to like I tend to like the clamp myself perfect personally, um, but in some cases it's it's uh, it's useful to have the the higher contrast. The other thing is this false color is nice if you're doing compositing because you can take this into Photoshop and then do color selections. It also kind of looks rad if you were doing t-shirts, but, um, but you can use the color selection range to actually go in and map images out or parts to, for creating alpha channels in Photoshop um, if you're doing compositing, which is super useful. So that's there as well. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk about was just exporting. Um, obviously, here we just we stop the we stop the image when it's when we're happy with it. We just go ahead and hit the save button, and it goes out here in ray trace mode. If we were running something in ray trace mode here, we would use the either capture viewport to file or capture viewport to clipboard. If we did it to file, it's going to bring it up. Uh, and there's going to be a scale. This is a new thing for Rhino 7. You can actually double the scale of something. Now it will go back and actually re-render it at that higher res. So if you rendered it at 1492 by 743 and you double the scale, when you say OK, it's going to go back and re-render the image at the higher resolution. So you can get larger images than just your viewport, but there is a, there is a trade-off as far as time. So. Um, so that's about it. I think we went from from opening it to saving it. I think that covers just about anything. So um, open it up for any questions and and thanks for your thanks for your time and thanks for inviting us. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle, for going through that. Um, I know I had I had one question. Is there anything available uh, uh, by ways of like like a render queue? As far as for doing like batch stuff, yeah. Um, or you know, maybe like a some kind of workaround. Not that I know of. That. Basically, what I do is I I like I said I go and I do my set views, and you know to be honest, because of the video card that I'm running, and like I said, I am running an RTX a Quadro RTX five thousand. Um, because I'm able to crack off renderings like every 11 seconds, I don't really worry too much about it. You know, batching used to be great when you had to do 200, you know, and you had to do 15 images and it took an hour and 45 minutes a piece. You would batch them and then go home. I don't really do that anymore. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just snap them off and move right. on. So. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, seeing, seeing the speed behind it. It's, it it's, might not have to. It, it went from it went from rendering stuff with something that I kind of dreaded to now I'm like, it's fun because it's just it's so fast and the and the gratification is so immediate, you know, mm -hmm. it, it really becomes it really becomes fun to do now. Fantastic. No, th this is great. I love seeing how the decals are applied. Um, and yeah, I, I love how you built this one, like this, the simplicity of just like that one kind of ramp background yeah. that panel yeah yeah 
there was there was another one uh and i'll just i'll run it while we're talking um but there was another one that i set up here where i just put um i put some objects out in space and assigned an emissive to them so you can see that it's just i just made these this little tube hat for it and um the uh i just have those set up and run that rendering so you can see we'll just let that run while we're talking if there's any other questions but you can see the difference between using something like this versus using um using panel lights and spotlights and things like that so these are actually shaped objects makes a cool uh makes a cool effect it also shows the the shoddiness of my surface qualities but that's all right <laughs> no, it's if, like I, it's may, on... if I may interject here a bit about the Q part oh yeah um, it is possible to in the very least write a script if you have a, a number of named views to automatically go through the named views have them rendered out and saved out to a file it is possible to create such, such scripts oh nice we don't have a, a, a ready a ready solution for for that but it, it shouldn't be too hard nice thanks nate for those of you who don't know, know nate he's uh he's one of the geniuses behind all of these new fantastic rendering tools so him and andy uh, uh and and the crew uh are the guys that brought you all of these wonderful tools so when the pandemic is over nate beers on me buddy <laughs> sounds good does anyone have any more questions oh, oh there was this one question about clown render pass uh, if i understand correctly it's the albedo albedo render pass and it's currently on my to-do list it's kind of working but it is not so it's not available yet in the in the ui but it will be hopefully soon this is incredible um and anyone else please speak up otherwise again you could uh linkedin uh reach out to kyle and team and he'll definitely answer your questions yeah for sure uh Looks well like there's a question about um perspective matching um to a background image also from uh brett perspective matching um the I usually just do it visually. Um, I'm <laughs> I was talking to Scott about this the other day. I'm like a I'm like a, a professional guitar player who can't read music, so I've come up with uh, a a lot of uh, so a lot of a lot of what I know is self taught. So um, I I usually just will put my image in the background and then I'll adjust the camera until the perspective matches. So what I usually do is just draw a box around my object. And then I use the grid in the box to kind of align with parts with objects that are in the scene. And then I'll adjust the focal length on the camera in order to change the, the, the perspective on the object itself. Yeah. But, um, but Nate may actually know more there, about that. There is, there is a perspective match command in Rhino, um, but there's some requirements that, you know, there's some limitations to it. The way Kyle does it, he can use just about anything in the background at any resolution. Um, to use perspective match in Rhino, what you need to do is you would set your viewport to the same aspect ratio that you want your final rendering to be. Then you set the image, the wallpaper, what's called wallpaper, which is the viewport background, to an image. And then by using perspective match, you can now, you know, hit some points and it will try to match the camera view to the, to fit in the perspective of the, of the image couple and, and, and one really important thing is you know have that viewport the right aspect ratio but the other requirement is that you can't take an a, a background image that maybe you cropped out a small portion of it um, you know where somebody for instance maybe had a really large image and then you kind of took the left the left uh, or the left hand bottom corner and you cropped it and that's what you want to use your image and the reason is, is that our perspective matcher wants the center of the camera, you know, wants the center view. So you got to take the whole frame of the original picture that you want to perspective match. So it's not, it's not one that you can, um, you know, like 
crop a small portion of the image out of the background and then try to, to match that because you're, you know, you're off center from where the image is, was taken. And, and that's where Kyle's method of just doing it on the view um, real time is, is sometimes more effective. Um, but, but, and another trick is um, if you want an object laying on, an, uh, laying on something that is in the image, you know, you can use the ground plane, but say shadow only. Yeah. And then it'll actually shadow over the background. Yep. 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 Awesome guys. Well, um, thank you. <laughs> there's, there's so much to, to yeah. refer back to on this. It's uh, mind blowing, but um, I, I wanted this one to be a fire hose. So <laughs> something we wanted to focus in on that very clearly, but this one, I just wanted to blast away. Yeah. So it, it, I, I'm thinking about this process, right? Like, as, as designers, you a lot of times have an idea of what materials you're going to use, but you're, you're really starting at form. But of course, materials influence the form that you're developing. And, and I think you're showing us the tools, but you're obviously you're not designing something from scratch. But when we take the action to put this in our process, I can imagine, like, especially if it's Chrome or if I think it's translucent, you're going to learn a lot by actually just modeling, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be translucent. Yep. And you're not rendering... There's not spending time rendering, which we've always punted later, or like you kind of break up your process or your concept phase, then you render it and then you learn. But now it's just like all somewhat more integrated. So pretty excited yeah. to, to see how this uh, takes, where this takes us as designers. So it, um, very cool. It brings the CMF process much, like like literally you go from pencil sketch start start laying out the model and you start working on your cmf from the very beginning yeah and and a lot of times you know as designers we tend to find the way along the way and sometimes you'll be paging through substance and be like oh my god that's a really cool material and you'll mm -hmm. throw it on there just to see what it looks like with no intention of ever showing it to anybody other than just doing some exploration mm -hmm. and find something that you hadn't even been looking for that then makes the product that much cooler, you know? And so it's the ability to be able to preview in the rendered mode. I can't stress enough how, how much of a change that's been in my own work as far as being able to communicate with clients and say, this is what I'm thinking about, you know? And it doesn't rely on, well, does the marker really look like Chrome or does the, with that gouache dot that you draw, I'm telling everybody how old I am, but that gouache dot on there, <laughs> you know, uh, it, is that bird poop or is that like, what is that? Or is that a hole or what? And it's, no, it's a highlight, man. But you can, you can, <laughs> you can bring that conversation so much earlier. And as designers, you know, you can explore so many iterations that, that again, are billable, right? This stuff is billable. And as, as consultants, especially, you know, Herman in your business, being able to preside all of this information that you can then add as value and then turn around and charge for mm -hmm. makes a difference on whether or not, you know, you get to keep going next year, you know? Yeah, um, it's huge. So, yeah. So awesome. And uh, awesome again on Rhino for continuing to push the, the limits of where you, you guys are going, uh, especially against really big, highly funded dog like companies. So, um, and Big props on being in Seattle. Uh, thank you again uh, for this uh, amazing tutorial and um, looking forward to like probably having you guys attend something or join us as part of the IDSA Seattle uh, drinks for drinks and whatnot. Um, uh, yeah, appreciate it right. guys. Thanks, awesome. that sounds great. So yeah, right. they may, these big companies may have lots of funding but we have Nate. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good you. to see you guys. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. bye.